All right, we are back into it. Part two of Prime Sports NASCAR on the Prime Sports Radio Network for this. Well, we're, we've got a couple more weeks to go for October, CJ, and then that's it. Uh, we've got three races for the round of eight, and then we're into Homestead, and the season will be over. So uh, let's hope that the racing is every bit as exciting as it has been over the last few weeks. We have had some pretty good races, which is great for a change. Um, yeah, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, we're coming up to a couple of tracks. Martinsville is usually good, but we are coming up to a couple of tracks, such as Texas, where things can be a little bit um, boring, uh, should you say. Somebody usually ends up hitting the, the setup properly and goes out and runs away. Uh, but hopefully we have some good racing like we have, uh, I think, the – the playoffs that NASCAR was looking for in order to generate the excitement and get drivers to, to really go after wins is, is kind of playing out as we see it. Um, so maybe that'll help us through the next couple of races. Well, uh, we have seen Penske dominate this race the last couple of years. Matter of fact, yep. Lagana Kozlowski, a win apiece, have led a combined 755 of 1,000 laps. So I'm not sure we want to see that. Yep on Sunday, uh, unless you're a Ryan Blaney fan. Maybe maybe he can make it three for three uh, because Ryan Blaney was certainly uh, and has certainly been the best Penske driver the last couple of races. Yeah, he's really pulled, yeah, he's really pulled his way through as Logano and, and Keselowski have you know fallen down the ladder, it seems. So he's peaking right at the right time. This uh, whole playoff format is all about making sure that you're at your best when it really counts and Ryan Blaney certainly is at his best uh, versus where he's been all season at this point. Keselowski obviously uh, slipped and fell. Logano just barely skated through. Um, so they got some things definitely they need to work out. Uh, Penske has been struggling or trailing certainly behind Joe Gibbs racing for quite some time now. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's totally unsurprising. Uh, but they've definitely got work to do if they want to be able to get at least one of their cars into the final four. Um, but they're not in as bad a situation as Hendrick, where he lost all three or three of the four, I should say, um, you know, last week. So, uh, you know, Chase Elliott's still out there. Penske's still got um, at least Logano and, and Blaney going on. So we'll see what they're able to do. But you're right. This uh, this track has belonged to them most recently. What do you think about I mean, it, w when you look at the standings and you see the three Gibbs boys, boink, boink, boink. I mean, does, is, it, is, is yep. it as dominating as it looks or is there <laughs> a realistic op option for someone, for a driver outside that, that, uh, that team uh, to win a championship? There's a realistic option because it's a one race deal, right? So um, it, you're going to have a one in four shot at winning it. So say Blaney goes out and wins this week at Martinsville, takes what he's uh, what he can learn from Logano and, and Keselowski, won the last two races, goes out, dominates, wins. He's he's in the sure. final four, right? Uh, you know, something else could happen next week, and maybe we see Chase Elliott there. So then you only end up with two Gibbs cars uh, spots and ending up, right. up going there. So, yeah, anything anything can still happen. Everything can happen in a single race, and that most applies to but when we get to, to Miami. So uh, even if you have all three Gibbs guys in there um, that are currently in the playoffs right now, uh, that, that one other person could still come out and make a call on strategy, do a two-tire stop, do a no-pit, uh, the late caution, and end up taking away uh, the championship when they've been dominating all season. And I will say, to answer your first question, yes, it is as dominating <laughs> as it seems. They've just racked up the wins um, so thoroughly this season. It's been unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen anything hey, like even it. Even though Kyle hasn't won since Pocono in June. That is mm -hmm. quite a ways ago. But we, you look on the show yesterday, Eric and I, we went over our final four picks. We, all three of us, had the top three. Uh, and actually, I shouldn't say that. We had two of the top three, uh, which was Denny Hammond and Martin Truex. I did go with Kyle Busch, mm -hmm. so I went with the top three. And then I threw in Ryan Blaney. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be a surprise as my one sleeper into the final four. Eric went with Harvick yep. and Larson. So Larson was his sleeper into the final Ooh. four. What are you going to do for your final four picks right now and your championship pick? 
Well, I got the three uh, Gibbs guys going in. They've just been way too strong. I, I think Kyle Bush has figured out yes. his issues for the most part. He's got to be able to get it into victory lane. So I think those three are a slam dunk. Um, you know, aside from what I just said, that anything can <laughs> yeah. happen in any race. Uh, yeah, it, uh -huh. it can. But, I mean, when you look at the statistics and the way things have been going this season, you, you've got to put them in. And I'll, I'll put Kevin Harvick as my my fourth person in there. I think that he's been very consistent throughout the season. I think he's probably been focusing on a couple of places, namely Phoenix, um, where he's been exceptional at in the past. And I think he's got a really good chance of making his way through. And then he'll give them he'll give them trouble in that final race. In All right, then sure. if because uh, I'm not going to put Harvick in as a sleeper. So between Elliott, Larson, and Blaney, no. who would you put in as your sleeper? I would actually put Elliott in right now. Um, you know, we saw it from William Byron. Uh, we saw it from Elliott as well. I mean, Elliott had a clutch win. Um, I'm sorry, Alex Bowman. Alex Bowman was the one on the Hendrick team that was really making things happen. He was pulling off um, runner-up finishes. He was getting himself out of holes really through sheer willpower. Uh, I think, um, you know, Elliott's certainly in a position with an organization to be able to do that himself. The question is just whether or not he's going to have that same level of hunger and if he's going to be able to pull it off. So I think Elliott's got a really good shot, and he would be my sleeper if I had to, if I had to choose among those remaining guys. All right, well, guys. that's good, because that means we have all chosen a separate sleeper. Uh, you went with Elliott, I went with Blaney, Eric went with Larson into the Final Four. Eric and I both took the same driver to win the championship, and it was the same driver that all three of us had as our official preseason sleeper at 22-1. to 1, We were all <laughs> shocked that Denny Hamlin was getting such generous odds that we did something that we hardly ever do. We all agreed on the same sleeper because it was just too easy to pass up. So hopefully everybody took our advice because that was a 22-to-1 sleeper that's looking awfully good right now. So are you going to make a 3-for-3 three three again with our pick to win the championship, uh, or are you going to deviate here and pick another driver? I'm going to deviate. I'm going to deviate. Uh, my heart tells me wow. Kyle Busch. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, yeah he, he, I, think he's, I think he's starting to figure out ex exactly what he needs. He just needs to pull it off and get into victory lane. Once that happens, he's going to be exceptionally difficult to beat, even from his teammates, Hamlin and, and Truex. Yeah, that's, uh, I talked a little bit about that yesterday, uh, which is why I took him as my second choice, even though he's 3-1 to one to win the race. Eric had the first pick. He took Hamlin at 4-1 to one to win uh, Martinsville on Sunday. You went with Kozlowski, which was, uh, I thought was a little bit surprising. You went with Kozlowski at 7-1. to one. I just, the re yep. only reason, not because, look, we, we just talked about the open the, the dominance of Penske, Kozlowski, Logano here the last two races. It's not that. It's just I, I would just expect, and I haven't looked at the data, but I would just guess that, especially for a former champion, the first race after you've been eliminated, I, I got to believe there's going to be some sort of a fall off psychologically that you're just not into it like some of the other drivers that are there competing with you. <coughs> See, my thought was the opposite, complete opposite. So I, I thought former champion still has something to prove, won at this track earlier this season uh, in a dominating fashion, um, just got eliminated, can come out and, and put put a ass whooping on these guys if he really, you know, got got the right setup and everything hitting on the on the on the marks throughout the day. So uh, just my, you know, similar thought process, except opposite okay. conclusion there. And. But I also said I had two weird picks this week. You did okay. Well, which weird? What do you mean? As far as Boyer, I would say my sleeper, my my Boyer. Yeah, I think he's also an odd. Well, pick. actually, you know, I don't think there are <laughs> I mean, a lot of good sleepers. Once you get past Blaney and maybe even Harvick, uh, just just looking. I mean, sure, there are a few guys. Jimmy Johnson has been doing well lately, but can he really win? Yeah. Uh, I like the way Suarez has been racing <laughs> right. recently, but he hasn't been been able to close yep. these races after getting off to pretty decent starts and he's been pretty good at this track the last couple of uh times out uh and newman has been kind of showing something the last uh couple of months so maybe he's due for a win and then there's boyer i mean boyer has been really good here over his last five races including the win last year 
which is exactly why I took him. So, um, yeah, he's he's got the win where he back in uh, 2018 when he led 215 laps. Um, he was seventh here earlier in the year. Uh, started that race tenth. He started on the front row in this race last year. Um, I think we've just seen kind of a roller coaster season from him. Could have gone with somebody like a Harvick perhaps um, this weekend, maybe a little bit more conservative pick than somebody like Boyer. Um, but I felt like he, for me, I felt like he was a little bit of an outlier, plus his odds were so much greater um, to be able to take somebody who's a recent winner at the track within the last two two seasons. Um, that's a pretty darn good deal. But you're right, Jimmy Johnson was still out there. He's been dominant at this track, but you're exactly right in your question. Can he really actually go out and win? Maybe. Um, I doubt it, Not though. Not a bad fantasy um, idea. He, he just Definitely, you got to play him from a fantasy perspective because he's going to be very. I, I was looking at the general uh, driver prices for him this weekend, and for somebody who's won as many times as he is and is starting to get a little bit of traction with his organization, at a place like this, you definitely have to put him in your fantasy. Yeah, I, he's got the new crew chief, and maybe mm -hmm. what we're seeing here with 11th or better in five of the six playoff races. Maybe that's yep. a sign that they've got something going because the one race that was outside the top 11 was Talladega, which is a crapshoot. So all in all, if they're kind of mimicking these playoff races like, OK, what if I'm in the playoffs ne next year kind of deal or let's just get off to the start that we want to. This is what you want to do. You want to throw in a bunch of top 10s on a consistent basis. And Jimmy hasn't done that in a few years. So if he can finish off the last four races, how he has started the first six playoff races, I think they're going to be awfully happy. I completely agree. I completely agree. I think I've heard him say a couple of times in the recent days that he's starting to find the traction, identify the things that maybe the team was lacking in recent weeks. And uh, as you pointed out, that it is starting to show in the results. He is, you are seeing his name up there in the top 15 much more frequently. He's not as much of an up and down uh, feast or famine, even though his feasts in the past few seasons have not even been close to feasting, certainly by his standards. Uh, but yeah, I think that consistency, they'll take that and they'll improve upon it going into 20, uh, All right, 2020. So uh, you had the third choice and went with Kislowski. If you had the first choice, who would have been your pick? I uh, would have been one of the Gibbs guys. Um, honestly, probably would have ended up being, um, uh, you know, probably would have ended up being Hamlin, to be honest with you. He's just been so strong, and he was so confident when he got out of the car saying, I can't wait to get to Martinsville. He's been so good here in the past. Um, second, really, only, I would say, to, to Jimmy Johnson at this track. I, I think he's a, a solid yeah, player we this week. We talked about him being a sleeper last week in the race at Martins. At, uh, mm -hmm. uh, where was he again last week? Yeah, Kansas. Kansas. So Kansas. 18 to 1 at Kansas. Yeah, he didn't have a great history there, but it didn't show any respect for the type of season he was having to put him at 18 to 1. And that's the only reason I took him as my sleeper. It had nothing to do with me thinking, oh, yeah, I could see something going on here at this track with Denny Hamlin. It was just he's having too good yep. of a season for him to be 18 to 1 at any track. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Completely agree. He's driving so much better than that. Uh, he's been, you know, even since his first win earlier this year, he's really not left the championship picture by any stretch of the imagination. And he's only gotten better as a, as a, as the season has come on and as the, the playoffs have come on. So if you can go to a place like Kansas where uh, Las Vegas thinks that you're a sleeper and probably not to expect too much out of you when you come to some place that your bread and butter like Martinsville is for him. Uh, you better watch out. He's going to be very good. Hamlin on has Sunday, 14 sure. top fives and five wins at Martinsville, fifth in March. Kyle's got eight straight top fives, <clears throat> including two runner ups and two wins, and has led over 900 laps during those eight straight races, third in March. And here's an interesting. Uh, stat Truex, who's three of the three favorites with Kyle and Hamlin. Truex is six to one. He's got seven top tens last nine, including three top fives and a runner up. He's never won at this track, was eighth in March. But the thing that's interesting is that all three of those drivers, even though they finished in the top 10 in March, none of them led a lap here in March. 
Fair enough. That's, that's, that that, <laughs> that does is open it. some possibilities that maybe we don't get a top driver, one of those top three to win, which might be good for your pick and Kozlowski. Or it could be good with Logano, yeah. his teammate, or Ryan Blaney, Eric's top sleeper choice, who's got three top tens in his last four races at Martinsville, including a fourth in March. Yeah, um, on the topic of, you know, potentially opening the door to someone, yeah, it can absolutely happen, but I, I, it's going to be hard to imagine. I mean, Kyle Busch uh, basically gave up qualifying last week to focus on the race setup, and that paid yeah, dividends, Yeah, what does that I mean? Explain, explain to the really listeners exactly car- what that means, because I was talking to Eric uh, off the air about that, because when you looked at the qualifying runs uh, last week and even some of the practice yep. speeds, uh, I it, it, it's you. I was hit. My head was hurting when I was looking at some of the drivers that had made, yeah. including Hemrick winning the pole, and some of the other drivers like Kyle, yep. who didn't. And of course, we we know what happened with Harvick. That's a whole big story in itself. But mm-hmm. it just looked like a very weird couple of days of practice and qualifying that didn't make much sense to the layman person. So how can someone? try to understand it more when they take a look at speed charts on occasion and they get what they got last week. Yeah. Yeah. All completely valid questions and anybody, you know, who's not very close with the sport and and knowing what's happening would look at it and, and find it completely baffling. But effectively, when you looked at that race, it was the last race before it cut off. There were only two drivers that had made it through and were safe. And that was Blaney and Larson by virtue of their wins. Everybody else stood a chance, potentially, depending upon what happened, of not being able to advance. The only way to get points and, and make sure that you are in a safe spot to advance to that to this next round, round of eight here that kicks off in Martinsville, is to grab stage points and grab wins. Uh, you can't do that with a qualifying setup. So a qualifying setup is to get the most speed out of the car for one single lap to, to give yourself a good starting position and choose your choose your pit stall um after that the race setup truly takes over and uh in order to make sure that your car will race um extremely well passing as many cars as possible being up at the front and being able to stay up at the front to be able to collect those stage points uh, you've got to focus on on the race setup so it was a calculated trade-off that they made they spent their time not focusing on that first lap track position by by focusing on the single lap speed but rather focus their cars over long runs and making sure that they're handling their tire wear uh, and their pit strategies were in in shape to be able to get themselves into position to collect points at each of the stages and then also at the end of the the race to be in a position to win um that's uh, you know some some teams will do that um uh, on given weeks but i think we saw so many teams do it last week just by virtue of the fact that there were only two guys mathematically that were locked in at that point to be able to go through. Everybody else had to rely on either winning the race or coming up with significant points okay, throughout so the race. Okay, so it's something that's not going to happen very often is what you're saying. It shouldn't. It shouldn't that volume of, of teams making that decision would not happen uh, on a regular week, and it should be very rare ultimately that we end up seeing something like that happen again. But it, it okay. will happen from uh, time to time. And and in in a nutshell, what what was the major negative about what happened to Kevin Harvick last week, before the race? Um, well, he had to go back to the yeah. the back. So they had gone through, if if I remember correctly, so they had gone through inspection. Um, they had passed inspection. They discovered something on the car that they needed to change. Again, focusing on the race because qualifying obviously holds the less importance. Uh, over the race points because he was one that wasn't locked in, elected to make the change, or and then by virtue of that, they would then have to go back through inspection. And, and as a result of that, since they had already gone through, they made the change, they ultimately had to give up that position and move to the back of the field. That's my understanding of what happened. So um, in effect, I mean, it worked out because he was taking that strategy anyway. They were focused. They were another one of the teams that was focusing on race up. The only problem was that that issue uh i would call it a mistake uh by the team or maybe it was dumb luck that they found something that would have broken or or would have um hindered them throughout the race 
uh, but ultimately they just ended up with a bigger hole to dig out of than the other guys that were able to hold their hold their runs and not move and to the back. And speaking of qualifying, field. seven of the last eight winners at Martinsville have started in the top ten, and four drivers, matter of yep. fact, three separate four drivers have won the last three races, not only the Penske team, but your sleeper pick, Boyer, was the other. And four drivers have won four of the last five races at Martinsville. Uh, what about if you had your top choice for sleeper? Would it have been Boyer, or would you have gone with Blaney? Oh, I would have gone with Blaney. Yeah, <laughs> I, the Ford. Um, while if you look at the top fives, Ford hasn't exactly dominated, so it hasn't been like four out of five. Uh, each race of the top fives have been Ford, but they've been prevalent up at the top of the field, um, and it's by virtue of Penske number one having that great um, uh, setup for and great run at this track. Uh, but Ford is, has a significant win advantage recently at this track, so um, you got to go with somebody like a Blaney who's number one got the the benefit of the guys who have dominated this race recently on their side but then also um go with the guys um uh that uh have the have the ford okay. engines for now, sure what about, uh, which is a lot of the reason why I ended up now Ford what as well. about elliot logano and harvick uh because i elliot to me would be a pretty good pick this week now the odds aren't necessarily where i'd want them but they're okay Considering he's got four top tens in his last five races here, he was runner-up in March, led 49 laps. He also led 100. He's also led 192 laps combined over his last five races at Martinsville, and he is coming in here after a very gutsy second-place finish uh, that catapulted him into the playoffs. So uh, Elliott was definitely on my short list for picks this week even though I went with Kyle as my number one. I might have, I mean, for me, it would have been Kyle Hamlin, and then my third choice might have actually been Elliot. Yeah, Elliot was absolutely on my list and on my radar, somebody that I looked at as well. Uh, he's certainly taken a step forward in terms of his finishes and his ability to get the job done here at, at Martinsville. Uh, four top ten finishes, two of them being top fives in his last five races at the track. And then the one time where <laughs> where he didn't finish in the top 10, he finished 27th, but he led 123 laps. So, yeah, he's, he's figured this place out. He was runner up here earlier in the year, led 49 laps. But what I didn't see and why I didn't go with him was some race out there where he was able to just be completely dominant. And, yeah, 123 laps is a lot of laps to lead. But when you think of Martinsville, you got 500 sure. laps. There was somebody else that went out and dominated that race. All right, above so him. who would you have gone with between Elliot Logano and Harvick? Okay. I would have gone with Elliot. And uh, what what about Logano Harvick? Yep. Logano's got seven top tens in his last eleven. He's the defending champ of the race, as we mentioned before. Harvick's got four straight top tens, including sixth in March. But he's only won once in thirty six races at Martinsville. Yeah, so that one. Win. Yeah, so that one win, um, you know, uh, kind of holds him back. Logano, on the other hand, has a crap ton of yeah. poles here so he qualifies really well um and when he gets out there obviously by virtue of having those poles he's going to lead some laps as well uh but there's really only one or two races where he, he's come out and really been a, a true dominating car and one of them was the win in this race last year plus the fact that you know he just barely i mean he was so close to being out of the out of the playoffs um last week so that's got to be weighing on him a, a little bit um, you know, similar to Keselowski, I think they both have something to prove to come out and prove uh, with Blaney now on the upswing and Gibbs still still beating them handily. So he might be one that can come out and get uh, get a result just based on his recent history of 309 laps and a win in this race last year. So I would put Logano. Ahead All right. Of and uh, when you take, by the way, as you mentioned with Logano, he has 13 straight top 10 starts at Martinsville with those five poles. So that is uh, some... Uh, so if you like Logano this week, you probably better take him now before those odds change. Uh, <laughs> yes. Chances are he might be on the pole again, and you'll, uh, you'll, be, you'll be happy... Well, you'll be regretting not taking the 7-1 to one today because you won't be getting that tomorrow yep. uh, or after qualifying. Okay. Uh, if you, What about what we've seen with the drivers and, and, and the results the last couple of weeks, because Ryan Blaney 
just had a tremendous win at Talladega. The way that he was able to get past Ryan Newman at such a clutch time in his career, I thought that showed an awful lot, not only talent-wise, but just to have that extra something that every driver needs to be great. I think Ryan demonstrated in that win, in that late pass over Ryan Newman. Uh, and then this past week, Chase Elliott, because uh, they've been kind of tied together, Elliott and Blaney, coming in together as young drivers. And here's Elliott showing a lot of yep. guts. Uh, it looked like maybe his luck was going to run out with that late caution with Kozlowski coming in and pitting and gaining tr uh, spots on pit, on pit road. But he just didn't have the car. And even though Elliott didn't win, he hung in there second place. And maybe if he doesn't finish in second, he doesn't even get to the playoffs. So that, that's, that's also showing a lot from Elliott. And the sport's in good shape with both of those drivers, Elliott and Blaney. Absolutely. You got two exceptionally talented young drivers. And we knew even um, from Blaney back when he didn't have the, the equipment that he's got now with Penske proper, we knew that yes. he was the real deal. It was just a matter of time before he was in the right equipment and able to really demonstrate what he was capable of. But when you think about the age of these guys and how long they've been in, we just talked about Kevin Harvick, who has 30 some races at Martinsville. These guys have like a handful compared to that. Imagine how good they're going to be with that edge as they gain the experience, as they build up that notebook of things that they need to be doing at different points in the race and the different parts of the track and different setup nuances that they're they're going to have in their in their mental file folder as they just continue to improve those two guys without a doubt have, and i would throw alex bowman in that boat as well he didn't he hasn't advanced as far as these guys but he was another one that when circumstances were down and he was in a really tough situation he forced things to happen and that's the type of tenacity that i i see in the difference that makes kyle bush who who he is uh, compared amongst the rest of the veterans in the top in the sport. So these guys, once they build up that experience and they get that bag of tricks that they um, are able to lean on when they've got, you know, less than ideal circumstances and that willpower, that extra edge that you talked about, they're going to be, you know, superstars mm. of the sport. I think they're both champions in waiting. It's just a matter of when it's going right, to happen. And what about them. Kyle Larson? Because he is, and again, he is Eric Sleeper to make it to the championship uh, round, but Kyle Larson after the win, a little quiet the last couple of weeks, a 40 to 1 to win this race, and he is a playoff <laughs> driver, which is because he's only had one top 10 and 11 appearances, leading just 29 laps in 11 races. He was 18th in March, so for a playoff driver to be 40 to 1 at a track, he must really be bad there. Well, yeah, he, he has not been good here. <laughs> this, is, this is not one of the, the tracks that he can point to and say he's had a lot of success and might even have a lot of optimism going into. Um, there are a couple of nuances to that, though. Uh, four of those races were, yes. were DNFs, of which two of them, at least two of them, yes. were engine failures. So presumably out of his control. Two of the, the other two were crashes. But look. Look at his starting. I mean, he's got he's got one lap speed. He's got to just translate it into into the race and being able to pull it all the way through. He started first or inside the top ten. He's got the pole back in the spring of 2017, and since then he started in the top ten every single time. So he has the speed at this track. It's just a matter of converting that into a full all race. Right. Distance. So if what we where would you put him in the category of a a sleeper fantasy pick? with some of these other drivers that we haven't mentioned yet at the top <laughs> I mean, he's got everything to to go for right? because he's still alive in the championship we already talked about elliot we already talked about harvick blaney etc um when you when you look at um the rest of the field um he's got everything still yet to play for he's a uh, clearly a race winner he's a guy that can come out and probably a lot of these tracks that are remaining even in homestead and and pull out the win he's just not he, he's been in the sport a little bit longer than the blaney's and the elliott's that we talked about earlier so maybe he should have 
have a little bit more success under his belt, but there are various reasons why he hasn't. I mean, he's at uh, Ganassi Racing, which isn't exactly the the Penske or the Gibbs organization, or even Stuart Haas. So, you know, it's he he's not got that same level of backing from the team that some of the other top drivers have. He's still being able to to make make hay though, um, and he's done really well race winner this year, which when you look at Gibbs dominance is no small feat. So um, to have him at a, you know, such an odd number, I think that's rather disrespectful as well, because just because he's got four DNFs out of his handful of races that he's had here in his career, two of which can arguably be, you know, not even his fault. Um, I think uh, he's in position to be able to surprise a lot of people, especially those people who are making now, those Now, last thing before I let you go, uh, was Harvick your pick because of Phoenix? Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> he's he's the the top at, at Phoenix. I mean, he's just been so dominant at the track with with nine victories, sixteen top fives, and twenty two top tens from thirty three starts. He's exceptionally good, and I know that's kind of trailed off a little, a little bit more recently. He hasn't been as dominant as, as we we had seen in the past, but um, plus, that plus the fact that he's you know, he's been consistent throughout the whole season. We haven't really seen him completely fall away. Even when he was struggling, he was still, you know, in position to be able to to win should anything happen. Uh, he was just a, a few cars back in inside the top 10. So that's the position that you need to be in and, and remain in every single race from here on out. Uh, and then when you get to, uh, to Homestead, anything can happen. You have to be in a position to win by the time you get there. And then certainly banking on his history at Phoenix to be able to come through, have a good result, and kind of put him in good position, even if he doesn't have the win in this round, uh, to be able to advance. To, yeah, because to Harvick, Homestead. believe it or not, just once this year had back-to-back -back races outside the top 10. Just once. Yeah. Yeah, he's been exceptionally consistent, and we talked about him not being able to get the job done, but he was still, I mean, he was still having good races. He was still running inside the top ten pretty consistently. So, really, no major alarm bells going off on his um, side right now. It's just a matter of, you know, Gibbs has been and since stronger. You took Elliott as your sleeper. Which race do you think Elliott has the best chance of winning? Uh, that's a, that's a probably a, a, a very good question. I probably put it at Texas, to be honest with you. Um, the Hendrick cars are extremely powerful, uh, extremely good in, um, uh, 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 very fast tracks of which Texas is one of them. And I think it's a track that can suit Elliot's style. So I would put his best chances to advance at, um, at Texas D though this week at Martinsville, he's got a yes. really and good he wants to keep well. the momentum going, uh, which is why I would yes, he think does. that he could be a pretty good, uh, pretty good pick this week. Okay, so rotowire.com, what are you going to be working on this week, CJ? Well, on no track activity on the on the Cup Series until we get to Saturday, so we'll have the fantasy preview up a little bit later than we normally would. It'll be up after qualifying, which I think starts at 4.30 on Saturday. Uh, and then um, we've got an afternoon race, so later that night or first thing Monday morning, we'll have the uh, race recap up on rotowire.com as well. And again, focusing on where these last champ last eight championship contenders end up falling out after we get uh, get through the first race of the th this three-round determining factor to get into home. CJ, appreciate it. We'll talk to you next week.